Welcome, everybody, to the eighth episode of Facts on the Ground podcast. I'm very pleased to have as my guest today, Taylor Hudak, who's an independent journalist with Activism Munich, um, a very ardent uh, supporter of Julian Assange's freedom. Um, she's covered the Assange trial uh, on the ground at Belmarsh. Um, and a lot of her work at Activism Munich has to do with uh, Julian's freedom. And uh, that's something hopefully we can talk more about today. And um, Taylor, thank you for coming on. Uh, I guess let's start with what I was just talking about. Um, your work with Julian Assange, how did you come to you know, this type of journalist work, journalism work with him and um, what was what compelled you uh, about his his situation, uh, you know, so much that you're pretty much focusing entirely on his on his extradition hearing now? Yeah, well, first, I just want to thank you for uh, having me on and to kind of um, provide everybody with a little bit of a background here. I actually uh, really started out as an activist and I co-founded the activist group, a decentralized acti activist group. Action for Assange. Uh, I co-founded it alongside Andrew Smith. He and I actually met on a uh, podcast. We both realized we were from the same area. So we decided that we wanted to do some on-the-ground actions uh, for Assange to bring awareness to his case. Now, as far as me personally, I became very passionate about this um, while in grad school studying journalism. And I realized that there was a lot of pushback against him among the academic community and even the uh, mass communication scholars were very much uh, against him. And I thought that was very strange. This is about a year ago, or probably about two years ago now. I didn't know much about the case uh, at the time. I knew very little, so I started to look into it more. And that's when I saw that there were serious human rights abuses uh, taking place with this case. And I realized that uh, if he, though this was prior to him being uh, arrested, but uh, I knew that the case was serious and that there was a high chance that if he were to leave the embassy at that time, he was going to be arrested. And if he was brought to the United States, uh, there would be serious, serious consequences for our First Amendment and for free speech and for free press. So that's when I became very passionate about the case. So I started out doing uh, online vigils with Action for Assange. Uh, it is myself, uh, Steve Poikinen, uh, Andrew Smith, and uh, Christy Doff at the time. And uh, I took a step back. I'm still with the group, but I took a step back. I have a more behind the scenes role now because I am working with activists in Munich, but they are still hosting their vigils, uh, which are held on Tuesdays at 9 p.m. and Saturdays uh, at 1 p.m. Actually, as we're doing this interview, they're going right now. But um, that's where I started. And so then while I was covering the uh, hearings in London, I caught up with uh, Activism Munich and they started to pick up on some of my work. And then I decided to uh, move forward and start working for them. And I've been covering this case quite extensively. OK, right on. And can you talk a little bit about Activism Munich for uh, those viewers who might not know about the uh, independent media outlet? Yes. So Activism Munich is a, of course, a German based nonprofit and independent news organization. Uh, it's very grassroots uh, organization. Again, this is based in Munich, Germany. I am the only uh, American, I believe, who works for the organization, at least uh, on with an on-camera role as far as doing journalism and uh, creating videos. And I work with a great uh, group of people. And uh, the organization has been around for a, a few years now, but very grassroots. And uh, Zen Raza is the founder of the organization. And um, we do a lot of interviews with whistleblowers, political dissidents, policy experts. We have a whole team of people uh, working together. We are viewer funded. Um, and again, you can find us on YouTube. It's activism. It's actually ACT TV, ISM Munich. So a little bit of a spelling change there for a, a look, I guess. Right. Uh, find us on YouTube and also Activism Munich, uh, our website. Right. Yes, I definitely recommend to viewers to uh, check, check those uh, various sites out. I've watched uh, a lot of interviews. Um, I think the most recent one I watched was with 
Chris Hedges, I believe. Um, or maybe I'm confusing him with Glenn Greenwald, even though they don't look anything alike. <laughs> but anyway, very we good content. Zen interviewed okay. both of them, yeah. Okay, yeah, they were both great interviews. Um, and I, I do recommend that viewers check that out. Um, so getting back to Assange, um, you were at the first segment of his extradition hearing in uh, late February. Um, can you describe what the atmosphere was like then and what it's like now? I watched, I watched your most recent report, I think, uh, your segment you put out yesterday about Assange, uh, Assange's hearing and how he's having trouble, you know, confined in that glass cage, hearing what's happening in the proceedings. Um, and also now the press having to call in because uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, they, they're having trouble hearing what's going on. And then there was also this very bizarre incident that sort of uh, parallels what's happening in the U.S. with police terror, uh, where this, this undercover cop comes along and says, you can't hang up this banner that you know, activists have been hanging up for, for months now, if not longer. Um, can you just talk about like <clears throat> from when you were there in February to how it got to now? Because it's, it's pretty dystopian in a sense. It's absolutely dystopian. That is a great way to put it. So I was there in February. This is at the end of February for the first part of the substantive extradition hearings. Now, the first day, the first two days, but especially the first day, there was so much support for Assange outside the courtroom. I was reporting from outside the courthouse um, at Woolwich Crown Court, which is connected to Belmarsh Prison. It's not the greatest area uh, in London. It's very... Uh, gloomy. It's very a uh, depressing area, to be honest. But people showed up in mass crowds. There were the yellow vests um, protesting. There were other free speech activists there. Did not really see much of the mainstream media, to be honest. On the first day, CNN was there. They were there for the morning half of the hearing. But beyond that, they weren't really covering uh, the trial. Maybe we'll see more mainstream media figures and corporate media figures be there the second time around. But mm -hmm. this Time around, it was mainly independent media. I was covering it from outside the courthouse. The protests there were very uh, peaceful. Everybody was quite loud, of course, and they actually had trouble hearing inside the courtroom. But during this hearing, uh, Assange was being treated extremely, extremely unfairly. Uh, number one, as you said, he was in a glass box. He wasn't even able to sit with his attorneys, uh, which is really impairs his ability to be able to participate in the court proceedings. And uh, he was also handcuffed numerous times, strip searched twice throughout this process. And at the end of the day, his legal papers and documents were being taken from him. And his attorney, Edward Fitzgerald, says that this impaired his right to a, a fair trial. Uh, now, since February, I've been doing updates on the case. Uh, you were mentioning one that I just put out uh, like two days ago. Um, every time there's a, a hearing, a case management hearing or administrative hearing, I'll cover that. So at this latest hearing, um, again, there were problems with journalists being able to call in and hear what was taking place because of, of course, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic and being that the UK is on a lockdown right now, they only allowed like six journalists in the courtroom. The others had to call in the phone line. It was so hor like, I guess it was such a poor quality. They could not hear mm -hmm. uh, much of what was being said in the courtroom. And then outside the courtroom, uh, Emmy Butlin, who is a longtime uh, WikiLeaks uh, activist and activist uh, supporting Julian Assange, has been peacefully protesting with uh, many others in the UK outside the courthouse uh, since last year, since April 11th of 2019, the day of his arrest, they always had banners up. And for some reason, it was this time around that it became an issue because apparently they are on uh, private property, which that was something that was never brought to their attention before. Mm -hmm. uh, no one made a fuss about the uh, banner being there, but it was a problem to this officer. And if you do look at this exchange with this officer, he's very 
hostile and he's a police liaison officer. Uh, I didn't put this in the report uh, to remain objective here, but since it's a podcast, I feel like I could give a little bit more of my interpretation of things, but police liaison officers, uh, I believe are intelligence gatherers. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing as a regular police officer. This is something that they have in the UK, and they're intelligence gatherers. Like the Mukabarat. <laughs> I'm sorry. They're like the UK's Mukabarat, the secret police of. Uh, I think that was under Saddam. You know, intelligence gatherers for purposes of neutralizing enemies, if you will. But please continue. Yeah, and we saw many of them uh, in the hearings. Uh, well, the first substantive, the first part of the substantive extradition hearings, we saw these officers. They're in blue coats. That's how you could tell who they are. But anyways, that's who this guy was. And at first, there was a belief that he was perhaps undercover because he wasn't in uniform. Mm -hmm. But um, he wasn't an undercover police officer. Uh, he works at the court, and I guess he was in full uniform uh, when the court hearing took place. But just very hostile in this exchange. Yeah. And so I followed up with uh, Emmy Butlin. Again, she is a longtime uh, WikiLeaks activist to ask her exactly what happened. And she told me that out of the s numerous hearings that they have attended outside the courthouse, they have never um, been told to take down any of their signs because you would think that a court would be public property. But I guess that look where the banner was at, it was not uh, public property. Right. I, I remember her making that argument in the video. And, uh, you know, it's not as if this is a huge banner. Um, and it's and it's on essentially the fence outside the courthouse. Uh, it's not, you know, like somebody scaled up the courthouse and put it across, you know, the top. Um, and yes, I agree. It was just a very hostile encounter um, over something very trivial or I, I don't want to say trivial because i don't want to trivialize what's what's happening to julian but given that it's been there for so long and then this sort of goon comes along and says no you can't have it um it's not only hostile it's suspicious too with what's happening now in the u.s with police and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later um but i i I saw a parallel there with the way, uh, you know, there are, there are people, there are police here who are um, infiltrating protests um, as agents provocateurs or intelligence gatherers or whatever. And uh, I don't see why the UK would be, you know, immune to that any more than we are. Um, but getting back to Assange, um, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to talk about his health because it essentially seems like he's being tortured, slowly tortured to death, psychologically and physically in Belmarsh. Um, and even the UN rapporteur on, uh, special rapporteur on, porch, on uh, torture, Nyes Melzer, I believe his name is, uh, he's come out and said as much. And uh, still, it's it carries on. And I'm wondering what your perspective is on the UK's so-called justice system. And and do you think they're doing this on purpose, uh, or is this how they treat all uh, prisoners, political or not? Well, I think that there is definitely a um, a targeted effort to probably treat Assange uh, far more harshly than uh, other prisoners. Uh, to give the audience some background information here, you're exactly right. The UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Melzer, um, who was somebody, in fact, who actually was a little bit skeptical about Assange when he was first given this case and the the, or when the case was first uh, brought to his attention, he kind of blew it off because he felt that he was someone just looking for attention. He kind of bought into the smear campaign uh, that's been circulated about Assange. So he rejected even looking into the case at first and then was able to change his mind after looking at the case and looking at what was happening to him and saw that he was absolutely being subjected uh, 
to torture. This will have long-term psychological impacts on him. We don't even know the full extent of what that's going to look like over a period of time, but it will be uh, it will be quite devastating and will require a lot of um, he, he, he's going to require a lot of medical attention. The doctors for Assange group has already issued uh, several letters for him to be released and sent to a hospital so he could uh, get the treatment that he needs. Again, uh, he was in the embassy for seven years mm -hmm. and uh, that takes a toll on uh, one's health. He does have a respiratory issue and um, I believe he is tested for uh, depression as well, among some other issues, I believe osteoporosis. So just many issues that he definitely needs to be uh, seen by medical professionals for. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so he's been subjected to prolonged torture. And I do think that the UK justice system is absolutely a puppet of uh, the US government. There is no doubt in saying that. Um, I think for the judges in this case, there are very serious motives to want to uh, really be very strict on Assange and uh, prosecute him to the full extent of the law because it seems that there are some rewards for uh, doing so. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the United States, we are living in a American empire at this time, of course, and uh, we're pressuring the UK to to extradite this person. And uh, it's not just the United States who's involved in this. Several governments have been complicit in this, of course. We have Ecuador, Sweden as well, um, and obviously uh, the UK. So this is a real opportunity for the UK to step up and uh, show that they are a sovereign nation and to prevent this uh, U.S. extradition. So we'll see what happens. Looking at the facts of the case, it seems quite absurd to me, even through a legal perspective, that they would grant this extradition. But uh, the judge in this case um, has been consistently ruling more on the side of the prosecution than on the defense. But we'll see what happens. Again, this case is still pending. The second half of the hearings is to take place in September. We're still not sure where. Uh, right. It will be in the UK, obviously, but exactly the location, uh, we don't know at this point. But he also applied for bail, and that was denied. And other prisoners who are uh, violent are being let out. Mm -hmm. And he is some, and just to be clear as well, I mean, he is not even serving a sentence right now. He's being right. held on remand uh, without charge at this point. He mm -hmm. served his time, so he's being held as a political prisoner at this time. Right. Um, <clears throat> do you know the reason why he was denied bail? Yes. So the judge was claiming that, um, so the defense was saying that he should be granted bail uh, because he is at an increased risk of contracting COVID-19. He's being held on remand. Uh, I'm sure there were some other arguments they are escaping me at the moment, but mainly this was because of COVID-19 and mm -hmm. his ability to catch this uh, illness because of his respiratory issue. And the judge denied that because she said that his health condition doesn't meet the requirements for somebody who, who is at an increased risk of contracting COVID-19. And mm -hmm. she also said that he was a flight risk, meaning that he is likely to uh, leave the country if he were to be um, let out of prison. That is not the case. He did assure, his attorneys assured that he would not leave because he has his uh, fiance and two children in the UK that he would be staying with. He also would be monitored by something like an ankle bracelet as mm -hmm. well. He couldn't leave. And the judge was actually uh, citing this, uh, his absconding in the past and not attending uh, a bail hearing. However, that's a really weak argument to make because at that time when he absconded, he was actually uh, seeking asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy. Mm -hmm. So he was an asylum seeker. So her argument there is really based on a false uh, assumption in a way. Uh, but yeah, that is why she denied this bail. And I don't know if they're going to reapply again. I'm not sure. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what happens uh, throughout the summer. Yeah, it's, uh, it's insanity. If you when you boil it down. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe I should have asked you this first when we started talking about Assange, but why his his case, if you will, is so important 
uh, especially for jur- uh, for journalists, especially, but for all of us, really. Um, and the insane uh, sentence that he's facing if he is extradited and um, maybe dispel this whole notion uh, that he, he's not a journalist um, that Assange haters like to keep putting out. Yeah, so many people, uh, number one, like to claim that he is not a journalist, members of the corporate media. Now, many of them are starting to turn around and start to really see the seriousness of this case. But for a while, and still to this day, uh, to some extent, many of them distance themselves from him. I think partially because of the very effective smear campaign against him. And then also, too, just because WikiLeaks is not your typical uh, news organization. It just isn't. But you know, for somebody who is not a journalist, uh, he's won several journalism awards. So it doesn't even make sense. And also to journalists, the U.S. government doesn't make any distinction between who is and isn't a journalist. Uh, When I say that, I mean, like, you're not given a state licensure to be a journalist, where you receive these uh, special First Amendment protections. So Mm -hmm. uh, his being a journalist really doesn't make a difference. when it comes to, you know, as far as his First Amendment protections. But uh, what they're claiming in this case, which many, his attorney who I spoke with, Barry Pollock, actually disagreed with this interpretation, and I believe other legal experts do as well. What they're claiming in this case is that uh, the Espionage Act of 1917 does apply to foreign nationals. However, the First Amendment does not apply to foreign nationals. So Espionage Act does, the First Amendment does not, which is a really strange interpretation. Again, like I said, his attorney, Barry Pollock, uh, disagrees with that interpretation. And it seems like such a huge uh, violation and an abuse of power. Mm -hmm. But um, the reason this case is so important is because it will set, if he is extradited to the United States, which we are trying to very much prevent that from happening, if he is extradited, he is going to be tried in the Eastern District Court of Virginia, which is known as the Espionage Court. I believe they have a 100% conviction rate for (laughs) any national security defendant. If he he comes to the United States, there's no question. uh, I believe that he will 100% be uh, unfairly convicted. So it is really scary if he is to be extradited. Now, what will happen is, is that it will set a precedent for journalists, specifically uh, investigative journalists. Uh, It'll prevent them from being able to uh, publish information that the government deems is uh, not suitable for uh, publication or for the uh, people to know. And that would be anything that's really exposing war crimes or exposing very, very powerful people. Anything could be considered national security it seems like at this point. So it would just set a very dangerous precedent for journalists and really change the way that journalists can not only communicate with their sources, but as far as the types of uh, material and information that they can uh, publish. So it it poses a a real threat to our First Amendment here. Um, Another thing with this case is that it is not only journalists who are impacted by this, but average people are impacted by this, even people who aren't politically uh, active, who aren't activists, who aren't journalists. If this case goes forward and there is a conviction, it really impairs everybody's right to know. Mm -hmm. Uh, People will be, will have less, far less information and um, an informed public is uh, the way we can really initiate some real change in this country and uh, throughout the world. So it's really important that people are educated and this is really going to uh, prevent people from having some really important knowledge and information on the certain abuses of powers being perpetrated by their governments and certain uh, war crimes that the US and other nations are engaging in, but especially the United States, of course. Um, so those are some of the a few of the real problems that we see with this case. Right. And uh, a few points <clears throat> to clarify. Uh, Julian is an Australian national. Uh, he's being imprisoned in uh, the UK in Belmarsh, with, which is a maximum security prison. And he's facing possible extradition to the United States. 
uh, which is probably the most bizarre legal um, web I've seen in my 37 years. Um, and then uh, I would just want to encourage anybody who, ha who hasn't checked out WikiLeaks yet uh, to do so, and especially to start with the uh, collateral, collateral murder video that was released in uh, 2010. Um, thanks, uh, in, in large part, to uh, Chelsea Manning's contribution. Um, it really shows what war is like. Uh, it shows what America's forever wars are like and how our military, uh, our government regards other people in the world. And uh, it's, it's a very uh, disturbing video, but worth watching. I think there are two versions. There's, a, there's an abridged one, and then there's the full version. But uh, if you want to get a glimpse into what uh, these wars were waging in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and Libya and et cetera, are really like it's it's a uh, it's a brutal glimpse, but it's it's well worth watching. And then uh, one more point, which is I think it's very grotesque and cynical of of a lot of mainstream journalists is that when WikiLeaks started, first started releasing information, um, they were more than happy to use that information for, for their reports. Uh, and that went on for several years. And then once Julian became persona non grata uh, in so many circles, they were like that to give up on him. And I think it's worth pointing out that that's really spineless and... Uh, I don't uh, I don't know if it's fear or if it's, you know, job security or what, but um, a lot of them have have turned their backs on him. And uh, that should be pointed out, um, I think. So um, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Yeah. So um, it was The Guardian, The New York Times, uh, Der Spiegel, a German publication, um, there may be one other, but I believe it is those three who published the same or which published the same uh, documents and information that Julian Assange published through WikiLeaks. And these are the actual publications that um, he is being charged uh, or it is he's being charged with espionage because of these very uh, publications. Again, that is uh, the information provided uh, to WikiLeaks through Chelsea Manning. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what this is about. It's not about the 2016 uh, election or emails or anything like that. It has to do with that collateral murder video you were bringing up and um, other information provided by uh, Chelsea Manning. So that's where this is coming from. And yeah, these, these other uh, publications, they uh, printed the same information, yet they are not being uh, held accountable. There's also this myth that WikiLeaks was the one to not redact uh, important names and uh, information that could have put lives at risk. That is not true at all. In fact, it was uh, The Guardian's uh, Luke Harding and... He needs to retire. Yes, he, yeah. Uh, Luke Harding in another... I, I want to say, uh, I don't, I don't know his name. It's a very generic name. I don't want to say it in case I have the wrong person. Okay. Um, so it's some, something Davis. His last name is Davis, I believe. Okay. Uh, but it was Luke Harding and another journalist. Uh, one of them or both of them uh, published a book where the title of a chapter was actually the password to like very sensitive um, unredacted cables. So if anybody was putting lives at risk, it was these journalists at The Guardian. It was Julian Assange and other staff at WikiLeaks who were, in fact, taking the time to redact this uh, information. So that whole uh, narrative that's been put out by uh, the corporate media, probably at the direction of the intelligence community, is just absolutely uh, false. So that is 
where if you bring this up to people and you say, well, hey, why aren't these other publications being charged? Not that I'm advocating for that. I'm not. Mm -hmm. But why aren't they being charged here? And they will tell you that it's because WikiLeaks published this sensitive information when that is just uh, absolutely false. It's just not true. Uh, right. So it does mean that there's a double standard. And of course, these journalists just um, are hanging him out to dry now. There's no support. Well, not that there's no support, but for a while, there was very, very little support. Again, now we're starting to see more journalists start to show support for Assange. And I really, you know, look forward to seeing more corporate media journalists really step up. And hopefully as um, the second half of this substantive extradition hearing approaches, more and more people will have the courage to step up and say this is wrong. And um, this is a huge assault on the First Amendment. Absolutely. And uh, just going back to Luke Harding, I don't want to harp on him too much because he's not really worth the time or energy, but he did write a piece or co-wrote a piece. Um, I think it was late last year, uh, maybe mid last year, um, totally unsourced about uh, Paul Manafort visiting Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Um, and it was obviously a smear piece to try to connect uh, Julian Assange to what we all know now is the bullshit Russia gate narrative. Um, and what's interesting about that too is that if you go back to 2014, Julian wrote an interview of, uh, I'm sorry, a review of Luke Harding's book on uh, Edward Snowden, even though Luke Harding had nothing to do with uncovering uh, Snowden's story or reporting what uh, Snowden uh, provided. Um, and Julian, it's a, it's a Newsweek review. It's excellently written, and he just eviscerates the book like point by point um, and basically said it's he sums it up you know this is a book written by a man who wasn't who was never there uh, which I thought was really concise and you know perhaps Luke Harding has a grudge because of that or you know he just knows he's a, a shitty journalist um, but uh, I thought that unsourced piece about Manafort, which still hasn't been retracted. It's still up on the Guardian site. Uh, that was that was pretty mind blowing. Uh, and, and it's still very disturbing that it's out there right now for people to read and take seriously. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree that the, the mainstream media propaganda campaign against him has been uh, relentless and very obviously propaganda um, for those of us who pay attention, I think. But uh, I think the dangerous part of that is that a lot of people who aren't familiar with Assange or don't exactly know the trajectory of WikiLeaks, uh, they're going to listen to somebody like, uh, I don't know, Rachel Maddow, for example, and say, you know, that Assange released the uh, the 2016 or WikiLeaks re released the 2016 emails um, ahead of the election to to destroy Hillary's chances. Um, I mean, that's still a narrative we hear floated in the mainstream media in the U.S. Um, so maybe just to clarify that, can you you talk a little bit about that email release in 2016? Because a lot of people have the misconception that. Um, you know, Julian did it in concert with the Russians and it was uh, um, a conspiratorial effort to bring down Hillary, Hillary Clinton and to uh, get Donald Trump into office, even though, uh, well, yeah, that's, I'll leave it at that for the question. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about the entire uh, 2016 um, Podesta emails, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's emails, uh, the DNC leak, um, there is just a lot of misinformation. The main point of that is the fact that Assange got this information, uh, from the Russians. He said that Hillary Clinton's emails were not uh, given to him by any state actor or any, uh, state party. 
again, there is speculation of exactly where they where they came from. Uh, we spoke on the free Assange vigil with Ray McGovern, and he could explain this far better than I can. I do not have a tech background, but from what I understand from what he was saying was that the way that the information was transported, it had to have come from somebody who had physical access to the computer or to the server. Uh, so it doesn't make sense uh, at all. And then also, too, uh, there's this... Um, Guccifer 2.0, which was uh, communicating with WikiLeaks and Assange. And apparently this Guccifer 2.0 uh, was supposed to be the uh, Russians, or they claimed to be uh, the Rus Russian intelligence. Um, that makes no sense whatsoever. Absolutely no sense. I would say that I believe it was probably in someone in the American intelligence uh, community, to be quite honest. I know that sounds conspiratorial, but uh, that is what I believe. And uh, also, too, if you look at the evidence here, I mean, this person or whoever was using this account was speaking in perfect English. And it makes no sense whatsoever that the sophisticated Russian intelligence would use Twitter to communicate a potential leak to mm -hmm. WikiLeaks. Uh, that makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, that would be extremely unsophisticated. The whole thing makes no sense. Um, but there... In again, uh, this gets a little bit uh, risky here, but we know that there was uh, Assange never has said who his source is. He won't say um, who the source is. It does seem some have said that he has hinted that it was perhaps Seth Rich, which was the murdered DNC staffer. If you look at his murder and the timing of it, and if you look at his background a little bit, it's very uh, suspicious exactly mm -hmm. what happened. They said it was a botched robbery, yet he had a very expensive watch and other value, uh, valuable items on him. Uh, I think quite a bit of money as well. None of that was taken. So mm -hmm. it's just very suspicious. Uh, again, Assange never says uh, who the sources are for any of the, the leaks that they receive. But um, looking at this, it seems that it is possible that there could be something uh, to that Seth Rich uh, murder. And yeah. Perhaps that he was the person that leaked it. I'm not saying that he is. We don't know. But something isn't quite right with that. Uh, but yeah, this has uh, stirred a lot of uh, controversy. And then a lot of people felt that Assange was, you know, all for Trump, which mm -hmm. is not true. Um, he was not, it, he's always remained apolitical, number one. But he even said that he, choosing between Hillary Clinton and Trump was like, choosing between cholera and gonorrhea. So uh, no no Trump fan by any That's means. Perfect. But That's people perfect. still like, yeah. Um, I, think, I think Trump would be the one with, would be gonorrhea. Gonorrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Clinton is cholera, yeah. Yeah. Because so, she, just, she just keeps popping up, you know? She just won't go away. Uh, she's like a turd that won't flush. <laughs> she uh, um, even said, well... Yeah, she won't, you're right, she won't go away. It seems like she's still trying to be relevant to this day. But the point is here is that she called for Assange to be droned. I mean, how could you expect him to favor somebody like that? I'm not saying that he favored Trump, he didn't. But, um, I mean, she called for him to be droned and is an absolute uh, warmonger and has been her whole life. WikiLeaks is an anti-war organization. But, mm -hmm. you know, go to WikiLeaks.org and type in Donald Trump in the search engine. You will find some very not flattering information and lots of it. Uh, go to WikiLeaks and uh, type in Russia. You're going to find a lot of information in there as well. So this idea that this is a pro-Russian, pro-Trump organization is just absolutely false. Absolutely false. It's something to uh, further discredit uh, the 2016 election and to kind of take the blame away from uh, Hillary Clinton for for losing the election. So, yes, it's very interesting uh, what had happened there and how that's still being used um, to discredit WikiLeaks. And uh, it's also very offensive, I think, to Russians as well. I think we lose that part of the story is that like we're allowed to blame Russia for everything without really taking a step back and looking that this is very xenophobic to be talking like this and constantly blaming uh, the Russians for potential election interference when the United States interferes in elections all over 
all over. They sent, yep. But we never think about that, right? No, no, because we're always taking a defensive posture. We're always doing the right thing and protecting people. And we know their democracy better than they do. Right. Uh, Yeah, and that's a good point that you made about um, WikiLeaks uh, releasing a lot of unflattering documents about Russia uh, that gets very much buried in the narrative and I think really puts the lie to uh, this argument that Assange was working on behalf of the Russians. But then, of course, you can also have some um, lunatic like Rachel Maddow come and say, well, he put out that information on behalf of the Russians as a, you know, to cover his tracks or whatever. And, you know, the conspiracy bullshit can keep going forever and ever. And uh, I think that's what makes it so hard for so many people who just rely on mainstream media to to understand what's going on, to understand what Julian's and WikiLeaks's contributions have been to uh, necessarily knowing what our government is doing in our name and and with our tax dollars. Um, So just to wrap up on Assange, um, where can viewers find more information or get involved in uh, Julian's defense? You mentioned Action for Assange, the the organization that yeah. you started and are involved with. But what are some other what are some other ones? Where can people find Action for Assange? Yeah, so Action for Assange, again, that is an organization I co-founded with uh, Andrew Smith. Uh, they hold vigils. Uh, it's Steve Poikinen. Um, and Andrew Smith, uh, both host the, the vigils now. And then I have to, of course, give some credit to, uh, some very influential people behind the scenes, Kimber Maddox and our tech guy, uh, Josh Benton, a big thanks to everybody over there who makes those shows happen. Uh, there are going, before I get into where you could, um, go to help uh, Assange and the different websites and, uh, petitions you can sign and all of that, um, the second half of the substantive extradition hearings is going to take place uh, in September uh, in the UK, of course, but here stateside, uh, Action for Assange is going to be holding a series of protests uh, in DC for the three weeks that that hearing is going to be taking place. And um, you could find more about that, if you go to action, the number four, Assange.com, you could also follow them on Twitter at action underscore the number four, Assange. There's also a GoFundMe uh, to kind of help these actions uh, kick off and to ensure that they do happen. It's so important that we show support for Assange uh, here in the United States. So they're going to be doing that. And if you want to join in, uh, please do. Of course, not everybody could be there for three weeks. Uh, we know that. But if you could make it for a weekend or for the day or or anything like that, just to join in on these uh, actions, do that. Again, visit actionforsange.com. Now, uh, in the UK, there is a very effective campaign called uh, the DEA campaign. That's a don't extradite Assange campaign for us back in the United States. All of us, when we hear DEA, we're thinking uh, drug enforcement. I believe it's administration. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, everybody wants to say agency. But we think when I hear DEA, I think drug enforcement administration. Uh, But in the UK, the DEA campaign, again, is the don't extradite Assange campaign. You can follow them on Twitter at DEA campaign. Um, go to their website, don'textraditeassange.com. Great resource for up-to-date information. And also they have several petitions there that you can sign to get Assange out of prison to ensure that he's not extradited to the United States. Uh, That's another great resource. Also, uh, the Defend Assange Committee. um, They changed their name, though. Or Julian Assange Defense Committee. Uh, On Twitter, you can follow them. They do some great work. And again, um, you could go to wikileaks.org for also uh, the latest information on his case. And um, also, if you're able to, uh, you know, donate to his funds, donate to wikileaks.org. They still publish documents uh, Mm -hmm. to this day. I would love to see some uh, information come out about COVID-19. That would be great. That would be really cool to see. Um, So anybody in the healthcare industry, 
you <laughs> have some information, please leak it. Or I, I guess it's beyond people in the healthcare industry, really. Uh, I think it goes up a lot further than that. But uh, the point being here is that uh, WikiLeaks continues to uh, publish valuable, valuable information. So uh, do check out their website. And uh, just spreading the word about Assange is really important. And um, this is a, a fight that must continue on, unfortunately, as the case proceeds. I agree. I agree. And uh, I'll definitely be standing in solidarity with him uh, through all of this. I think just what's been done to him physically and psychologically is it's a crime against humanity. And uh, I, I really, I don't, I, I don't think things are going to go well if he gets extradited to the U.S., yeah. uh, especially on top of everything we're dealing with here now with uh, police shooting people in the, in the, in the face with, uh, I want to say rubber bullets, but um, my friend, I think you know him, Max Blumenthal, he made a good point on Twitter last night that we need to stop calling them rubber bullets. They're actually steel bullets just covered with rubber. And there are reports that some police are even taking that covering off. So they're basically firing what amounts to live ammunition. And, uh, you know, I think that's why you see a lot of people getting hit in the eye, losing their eyes, um, getting it's hit in the limbs. It's, it's tragic which ha what's happening to people. I'm seeing the injuries that people are sustaining from these rubber bullets. Mm -hmm. And it's outrageous. This is so outrageous. And um, what's going on in the U.S. right now uh, with the police literally being, with the military and the National Guard being called on um, our own people, to mm -hmm. me, is just devastating. I find it so problematic. I don't know how anybody could see this and not find so many problems with the National Guard and the military being deployed against its own people. And they're using tear gas against, um, which is something that they've done for years and years, uh, using tear gas against people. But the fact that people are losing their eyes is so mm -hmm. uh, disturbing to me. I mean, you're that very much... Um, handicaps a person, uh, if that's the right word. I mean, your whole life has changed. It, it's just so terrible. And in addition to that, of course, that video of what happened to uh, George Floyd is horrific to watch. It is uh, horrific to watch. We need to have um, some sort of measures in place to ensure that people like this are not entering uh, law enforcement. I'm sure that there is some sort of psychiatric exam that you have to go through to become a police officer. I would hope that there is. Well, whatever's in place right now is not working. Uh, we need to have better measures in place to make sure that these people who are not well and not okay do not get into law enforcement. And if they happen to experience something really traumatic that may um, cause them to not be stable while on the job, uh, that needs to be detected early on and taken care of immediately. I don't know this guy's history. And I'm not making an excuse for what he did, but um, apparently you know, he he has a long history of the past that caused him to to be like this, where he should have not been working anymore in this profession. Is he just an evil person? It seems that way because I heard and I don't know if this is true. I heard that he has had a history of perhaps doing that or being really aggressive with people. Yeah, that's that's true. I've I've uh, I've read that and uh, confirmed it talking with multiple people. Um, I don't know exactly what his violations were, but um, apparently the uh, the Minneapolis police didn't care enough to take him off the street. And uh, yeah, I mean every every video of of a police murder is horrendous, but. This might be the most egregious one I've I've seen of of all of them since they started coming out. I mean, it's nine minutes and this guy pleading for his life, and then once it's over, the cop gets up and looks at the phone, the person who's filming him with this psychopathic smirk, and um, and it's right there on video. He murdered somebody, and yet he's I think the 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 
biggest charge they've brought they've brought against him so far is um, second degree murder. Um, clearly, it's first degree murder. I mean, if you're kneeling on somebody's neck for nine minutes, like that's enough to premeditate what you're doing. Uh, so, I guess yeah, we. I wanted to talk about that with you, so I guess we we've gotten into that a little bit. Um, I've been. Do you know Michael Tracy? Yes. Okay. I don't know what your opinion is on him, if you know him or not. I don't um, know him personally, but I know who he is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the only reason I want to bring him up is because he tweeted something the other day that I thought was just outrageous. And I think I may have retweeted this, the comment, if it's the same thing. What, what tweet was it? Uh, I'm just paraphrasing, but it was about if journalists are involved in an unlawful uh, protest, whatever that means, right? Unlawful protest, that they shouldn't expect to be treated um, as journalists. They're part of the assembly. And so if they too get shot in the face with rubber or with a bullet, essentially, uh, you know, they shouldn't, they should expect it. They're not, they shouldn't expect to be afforded any protections. And I thought that was just I mean, he styles himself as a journalist. I, I know he writes sometimes for the Wall Street Journal. I don't really know what journalism he does outside of that. It seems like he just sits behind his computer all day and tweets. But what's your, you know, as a, as a journalist who actually goes on the ground and, and is doing real journalistic work, what's your response to a tweet like that to somebody saying, well, if you go to cover a protest or... <laughs> If you're covering, uh, if you're in a war zone, that you you shouldn't expect to to be exempt from what happens simply because you're a journalist. Yeah, I actually I did make a comment about this tweet. In fact, and I just said it was a really really bad take. Now, yeah. it could be interpreted. I've seen other people interpret it as what he was saying, which I don't think this is what he was saying. But others have said what he meant by that was that he wasn't agreeing with it but that journalists should not expect uh, to be given or to be treated uh, fairly and like not arrested and not um, attacked by the police in these scenarios. I don't think that's what he meant. I think that he was actually like agreeing with the fact that journalists shouldn't be given special protections. Now, he is correct in saying that journalists actually don't have um, special protections as far as like you're not granted any additional First Amendment rights just because you are a journalist. Right. Um, but the point is, is that he f made the mistake of saying that, and again, this is generally speaking because there are citizen journalists who are filming there but are a part of the protest, but they could call themselves journalists too, but still be very much a part of the protest. Mm -hmm. But let's, you know, let's say if we're talking about journalists with press passes who are really going there um whether they support the actions or not that doesn't matter but they're actually they're covering this they're working they're they are not a part of the assembly they're working and he failed to make that uh distinction i i, I absolutely do not agree with what he said when i read it i just couldn't believe that he actually said that um yeah. I just found it to be very uh, unfair. He just said, just because you're a journalist doesn't mean you should be exempt and given special privileges. But the point is, is that they're there doing a job. They're working. Right. Right. And, and <laughs> no, they, I, I agree. You know, um, there is no law in place that says they have special privileges, but for people like us, like you're a journalist and for somebody like me who cares about getting uh, information from the ground, it's important to have both citizen journalists and, um, I guess, professional journalists, for lack of a better word, independent journalists. It's important to, for us to get those perspectives. And when you say that, you know, when you're basically declaring open season on those people, I think it's very dangerous and totally counterintuitive to what, uh, transparent journalism should be and I've been you know I I have a very small following on Twitter and definitely not a check mark and that doesn't matter but 
I've been really railing back against what Michael Tracy has been tweeting because he has this substantial platform. Uh, people like and comment on and retweet what he tweets. And I think he's been putting out some very dangerous and uh, even even sociopathic information uh, in his tweets. And um, I kind of wanted to talk to a journalist about that. So I, I'm not just railing against this void on Twitter. But uh, I wanted to get a journalist's perspective, too, on, on, on what they thought about that. So uh, it's good to know that, uh, that you find it insane as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I found that tweet to be uh, totally, totally ridiculous. And he goes on further to, like I said, he even was responding to some comments in the tweet where he made it very clear that he doesn't think that journalists should have special protections. And I'm not even saying that they should have special protections, but we do have a free press. And, you know, if you are there and you are reporting on something, you're working, um, that needs to be honored and you shouldn't be arrested. It's very clear that you are not actively participating in the assembly. And I would go as far as to say that, you know, people shouldn't even be getting arrested at these uh, protests just for simply protesting. It's their right to uh, do so. Protests are meant to disrupt. Now, yes, there have been some things uh, going on where people are dying at these protests and that is not okay, of course. And mm -hmm. that's unacceptable. Nobody should be uh, dying at these uh, protests. People shouldn't be getting killed. Um, violence shouldn't be uh, taking place. I will say uh, it's... Now, I don't have any evidence of this specifically when it comes to like these specific protests, but we know historically that the intelligence community has infiltrated uh, for years and years. They've infiltrated... Um, certain demonstrations, certain activist groups and movements, uh, either encouraging violence to get these groups investigated or to get them to act uh, in a way that gets them arrested, or they go to these events and they actually start the violence uh, themselves. And although I don't have evidence of that happening in this case um, specifically, it's likely that that is also what's taking place. Now, people are angry. That is not, I'm not saying that that's taking away from people's justified anger. I believe people are, are very angry about this. I'm angry about it. You're angry about it. We all are. But I think that it could be, it could be that there are some agent provocateurs infiltrating the situation and playing up on that anger and may, maybe perhaps encouraging some of this violence. I don't know. Maybe it, Maybe not, but they, it's possible. I can tell you uh, for a fact that they are. I've seen video of uh, police. Uh, I'm not sure in which city it was in. They pulled up in what looked like an alleyway between apartment buildings, you know, like some kind of uh, route that people transverse often. And uh, these... Uh, it sounded like a couple. They were filming it from their apartment window, uh, maybe f five floors up. And these cops pulled up with, uh, you know, one of their defense department provided SUVs. And they started unloading bricks and putting them on the sidewalk so that people who were protesting uh, might feel compelled to pick them up and throw them at something. Um, I've also seen footage of cops going around holding umbrellas over their head. I can't say if they're cops, but they must be working for the cops, uh, smashing in the windows of cars with a hammer. Um, sorry, my roommate just gave me something to uh, look at. Yeah, this is, uh, I don't know if you can see this. Um, no, I can't. To... Can you oh, see that? Yes. That's... So th that was the cops laying out the bricks. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tip like so, uh, so typical to try to initiate uh, violence here. And I think that it's worth um, talking about that. And then I've seen some who have pushed back against that and said, well, you know, by saying that you're taking 
you're saying that these people have no right to be angry, which I think is a huge stretch. That is not at all uh, what I'm saying, but these people all receive the same tra training. These mm -hmm. agent provocateurs are trained in the same way. They have the same methods and tactics about um, about going uh, through with this sort of provoking of violence. And uh, they also try to disrupt groups and pin people against each other. It's really crazy. And I think about the psychopaths who take on these uh, jobs and are willing to be informants and willing to, to do this sort of work. Like, you're a shitty person yeah. for doing this. Like, you are a, a really shitty person um, right. to actually try to harm uh, groups that are trying to make the world a better place. And in four, and five, four to five years, typically from studying this stuff, um, they usually let these people go after four to five years and they won't support them or back them up because they don't last very long. They're going to be uh, discovered. So that's why it's really important that activists are aware that this happens and that they know mm -hmm. what signs to look for. Now that doesn't mean be suspicious of every single person around you, but once, you know, if somebody is starting to call for violence, uh, that's a huge red flag. That is not to say that there are some legitimate activists who may perhaps uh, be really uh, wanting to engage in violent activity. But even in that case, you do not want to uh, go down that path. Even saying something, um, they'll try to get you to say certain things. Even that is like really uh, suspicious and it ruins your whole movement. It makes people on the outside who maybe would be inclined to listen to your message or join you or see you as an ally, kind of want to distance, them, distance themselves uh, from the organization. I feel like when maybe some people who are on the fence about Black Lives Matter and their initiatives or want to hear more and what they're doing, um, if they're constantly being fed information from the corporate media that you know Black Lives Matter and these organizations are engaging in violence all the time, uh, without showing any of the peaceful protests, that's just going to harm the the movement because then people aren't going to want to uh, join in or associate themselves with the group. And there's so many peaceful protests that we're not seeing on the corporate media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I will be attending one tomorrow in uh, the town I live in, in New Jersey, which is Nutley, if uh, the NSA is listening. Um, <laughs> And uh, even around here, uh, we're not far outside of uh, New York, but even around here, there's a uh, at least one group of sort of uh, proxy police goons that's been floating <laughs> around to different protests and trying to disrupt them. And they have probably the stupidest name I've ever heard. Uh, I think they're called the Boogaloo Boys. Um, not sure what that's all about, but um, apparently they wear Hawaiian shirts and military fatigues or something. That's how they're identifiable. It's very bizarre. But I hear they all wear the same shoes as well. They all wear the same boots, I guess. I heard this from two people. Okay. I know something I never observed, but I guess that's something that they'll do because they do need some sort of identifier. But if you look right. at their shoes, I guess, they're always the same. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of like a like a spin-off of the Proud Boys, I guess you could say. And uh, but yeah, I think that's a really important point for people who are going out to um, in this country or even in the UK to protest what's happening to Assange. Um, you just have to be wary of a lot of people, um, like you said, especially when they ask you suspicious questions or somebody calls for violence. Um, I'm not a pacifist. If a police officer tries to harm me or somebody near me or somebody I love or care about, I will defend them or myself. Um, but I don't believe in just showing up and inciting violence for no reason. Um, but yeah, I think the, the agence provocateur risk is so huge now. It, it's just, it has so many different iterations that it's, uh, and they're obviously doing it to scare people away from protesting, but it's, it's definitely something that we who attend these protests, uh, really need to be careful of. So anybody out there who's watching, who's protesting 
definitely uh, keep your eyes and your ears open and, and be smart about who you talk to. Um, and always have a 360 degree vision. Um, so I guess bef uh, before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you about um, the 2020 U.S. elections. <laughs> and uh, we're basically seeing this Democratic Party that's so ossified, so sclerotic, it's, it's pathetic. Um, you know, not that the GOP is any better. Um, but then intertwined in that you have, you know, Joe Biden is, is the nominee and he has multiple allegations of sexual assault, including rape against him. Um, you can watch hours of video of him. Um, yeah. what I would say groping women and children, uh, without their consent. Uh, and then you have Tara Reid, which, uh, whose story I absolutely believe, um, not to harp on Michael Tracy too much, but he also tweeted something, uh, about how we shouldn't believe her for some reason, with, which I thought was really like, I don't know. I almost, I almost wanted to be like you're. You're like a doughboy who seems like he hasn't had sex before. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, how do you do? You not understand what the trauma of rape and sexual assault. But anyway, I'm wondering if you can sort of just like unpack from your point of view what's coming up with this election because basically we have the choice between Donald Trump and. Joe Biden, which are two sides of the same coin. Um, you know, I sus I've been saying this and I, I'll pro I might be wrong, but I suspect Hillary might try to come in at the last minute um, and negotiate something with Biden. I don't know. But um, what's your overall assessment of this run up to the 2020 elections and, and our options and our, you know, what it implies for our future going forward um because none of this seems democratic at all and with the virus and with the police terror it just seems like things are getting worse and worse and whatever semblance of democracy we we have or had is is quickly diminishing certainly uh so i mean we are left a once again with uh two pretty unfortunate uh, choices. I'm actually not to, and again, this is coming from a perspective of, I really believe that no matter who is in office, essentially things are going to stay the same. I know that's super negative, but I just believe that I really the president, that. yeah, and unfortunately the president and our politicians and the people who are leading this country are really just sort of like the face of, um, our political uh, structure that really doesn't exist, I guess. And um, I feel that it's really there to make it seem as if we do have a democratic uh, process, but ultimately there are uh, people behind the scenes, uh, namely people in the intelligence community who we would never heard of before, who do run the show, who run everything. We know this from Snowden documents. In yep. the Snowden documents, we see these agents discussing who they wanted to win uh, the election. I can't remember what election they were referencing, but they were talking about if they wanted it to be a left-wing person, the Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate. And ultimately, uh, they say that they really don't care who wins the election because ultimately that's not going to uh, change at all. The military um, or, or the ways of the military is not going to change uh, US foreign policy at all. Much will stay the same. So, um, I mean, I think we're, we're left, of course, with uh, not, not the greatest of options by any means, some pretty poor options, truthfully. I'm really, really surprised. Well, I shouldn't be surprised, but I, I can't believe that the Democrats are, are putting forward uh, Joe Biden. I yeah. can't believe it. They had a real opportunity to perhaps beat Trump, 
with uh, Sanders or uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Mm -hmm. um, I think they had a real opportunity with those two. Both of them together would absolutely, I think, uh, beat Trump. But they put forward Joe Biden and he can't even speak. I mean, the guy can't even talk. And yeah. it is, you know, really, and it is really unfortunate to honestly watch because this person is clearly not well. They're getting mm -hmm. older. Uh, he should not be in the public eye at this point. Um, he should be uh, settling down his career, but uh, he, he can't even speak. And we're, we're left with some really poor options. But it's not really something I'm too uh, concerned about, to be honest, because I see, you know, whoever's in office, if it's Trump or Biden, things are going to stay the same. My real focus here is uh, the way we really get some important change going on is by going to the streets, um, right. by doing good journalism, independent journalism, and talking about really important issues fairly. Now, um, the convo couch of uh, Fiorella and uh, Pasta have been doing a great job covering the election. They were actually traveling all over the country, covering the election, um, exposing a lot of the fraud that was going on during the primaries and the Iowa caucus and all that stuff. Um, they did a really great job. They still talk about it. Um, of course, because of COVID-19, I believe they were not really able to travel uh, too much lately, but always asking the candidates uh, about Assange mm -hmm. um, and their perspectives on, on his case and how they would treat his case. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, American electoral politics is not how we're going to save this country or the world. Exactly. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And just to touch on uh, Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard, um, who both, I think, I think Tulsi, uh, foreign policy wise, uh, had an excellent platform and Bernie domestically had an excellent platform and they both walked off the field and endorsed Joe Biden. And, yeah. um, what are your thoughts on that? I felt betrayed in a way, but also not surprised. I think that's a fair, uh, way to put it. And I think a lot of, um, Bernie supporters, like very, very strong Bernie supporters who donated to his campaign and even worked for his campaign felt uh, betrayed. And probably uh, same with Tulsi, but I know especially uh, Bernie people felt betrayed, which I think is uh, justified. You know, he asked for money. He said that he was going to uh, stick it out and he didn't. And he turned around and uh, supported Joe Biden. I don't think it's something that's too shocking. Uh, people were very disappointed in Tulsi for doing the same where Joe's my friend. Yeah, he always <laughs> said that. <laughs> always. Uh, Tulsi went ahead and endorsed Joe Biden. She did say that she was going to endorse whoever was nominated. But politicians don't really keep their promises. And, you know, that would probably, if she had to pick a promise not to keep, that would probably be the one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't, I don't think people would hold it against her or her supporters would hold it against her for not supporting uh Joe Biden, um, because at that, and the reason I say that is because at the time that she came out and said that she was supporting Joe Biden, it was, he was not even the official nominee at that point. Bernie was still in the race. So that's why people were a little bit suspicious of what was going on and quite disappointed. So again, at the end of the day, they're all politicians. I mean, Bernie has been in politics uh, for a very, very long time. Tulsi has for the majority of her adult life, I believe. <laughs> Um, so there's always this suspicion when people are in politics for so long, um, they know how the system works. They've been in it for a while. Um, and I think that's why Trump probably appealed to so many people because he was seen as an outsider. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's why uh, he was able to get a lot of Obama Democrats as well. But uh, to me, I'm not surprised because, again, they're just politicians at the end of the day. Now, Bernie... Um, he has always been someone who has had the same uh, policies, so that gives him more credibility. I mean, he has consistent, pretty much consistently held the same viewpoints for his entire life and has fought for the same issues. Um, so that says something, I guess. But at the end of the day, he did cave, and he has, in my opinion, no real backbone, to be honest. Yeah, I don't think he does either. 
Um, and that's something that I was trying to point out. Again, I'm not, you know, some Twitter influencer, but I was trying to point that out to people who, people whom I respect who are really like rallying behind him that if you go back and look at his history, uh, especially the votes he made under the Clinton administration, um, they're not, foreign policy wise, they're not, um, they're not humanist votes. I mean, he voted for, and I'm going to keep pointing this out until people finally get it, but <laughs> the 1998 Iraq Liberation Act, which was basically Clinton's uh, way to continue bombing and sanctioning Iraq into, uh, you know, genocidal proportions. Uh, he voted for that. Um, and I think that says a lot. And uh, he he's against BDS. Um, he basically Russia-gated himself during his own campaign. Uh, so, yeah, I... I it's so disgusting to watch. Yeah. Started condemning Russia for interfering on his... Be oh, I couldn't even watch that. Yeah. And then people made excuses about it, mm -hmm. which was stunning. Like, why? I, yeah. Why are excuses for these people? Right. Well, we're and never going to get better as a country if we keep making excuses for politicians and uplift them as rock stars. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's another thing, too, that uh, a lot of Bernie supporters want to deny or, or play down is that, that, that there was this huge cult of personality around him. And um, it doesn't exist anymore as much as it did because he dropped out, but it was totally there. And I can't speak for the millions who supported him, uh, but it definitely seemed like they were more interested in his charisma and, and what he was saying as opposed to his policy platform because I went to his page many times to do research on, on what his, his policies actually are and foreign policy, I mean, I'm sure it's still up. It's so weak and, and so vague yeah. and it's, uh, I kind of knew that he was, he was going to crumble in some way. I, I wasn't hoping for him to, but, um, I do think that a cult of personality played a large part in it. And, uh, some people are still holding on to that and the others are denying that it ever existed, but, um, I think it was there. Um, so anyway, the last point I want to bring up, which we touched on, is uh, Hillary Clinton. And I, I mentioned that I've been suspecting that she's going to try to come in at the last minute, sort of this like October surprise, right? Yes. What do you think about that? I'm not asking you to make any predictions, but just, uh, you know, she keeps popping up, as does Obama. And, uh, I mean, obviously Obama can't hold the office again, but uh, I feel like Hillary's behind the scenes at the DNC and, and manipulating a lot. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if she jumped out in October and said, I've struck a deal with Biden. I'm going to run for president. He's going to run for vice president again or something like that. Um, because, again, she's just like this. She won't go away. So I'm just curious what your assessment of that is. That would be pretty uh, wild if that were to happen. You're not the first person I've heard uh, make that prediction. That she'll kind of jump into... Uh, the race. I'm not sure. I feel like that would be so crazy for that to happen. But 2020 has been very, uh, quite the ride so far. Mm -hmm. um, that would be, I mean, I, that would be a, a really, uh, truthfully amazing, I guess, if we were to have another Trump, uh, Clinton all over again. Right. Um, if she's going to do that or not, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, she she has such an ego, and she wanted to be the first female president so bad. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put it past her to 
do just about anything she can to get to the top and to reach her goals. But she's almost incapacitated by her goals to the point where she can't even admit any faults. Right. Um, so I want to put it past her to to do something like that, but uh, we will see. I did see on Twitter, somebody retweeted, it was a clip from, I want to say, MSNBC or CNN, where somebody in the DNC kind of made this slip up where they said something along the lines of, uh, well, Joe Biden isn't really our official nominee or something like that. It was like a slip up. It could be interpreted, but I remember watching it and I was like, oh, well, it could be interpreted a little bit differently. But some people were seeing it as that there was maybe some agenda behind the scenes going on that we weren't uh, aware of. And it kind of came out in this interview on accident. So we'll see. I don't know how Biden would be able to get through a debate with Trump. I exactly. mean, how that is going to be such a joke. Like, I, how can he debate Trump because Trump is unhinged. He is going <laughs> to uh, call him out when he makes mistakes like that. And I could just hear it now. He's going to tell him, you don't even know what you're talking about. Right. Um, you don't even know what you're saying. He is not afraid to do things like that. And I think it will just be very brutal for uh, Joe Biden, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, Max Blumenthal pointed out, um, uh, I think it was earlier this year, um, or it might have been right after, you know, Russiagate basically collapsed and we all saw that Mueller was just like this doddering dingbat who didn't even know anything about his own investigation. But he said now, now Trump is going to go, actually he quoted Steve Bannon as saying now Trump is going to go full Trump, like unbridled attack from all angles and not hold back. And I can definitely, I mean, I think he's definitely been doing that. And yeah, in, in a debate with Biden, I, it would almost be sad to watch if it weren't Joe Biden. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. That's, that's interesting. Uh, the point you brought up about, uh, the DNC, uh, person making a slip up. Um, cause maybe that, maybe that's what they were alluding to, but we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Mm -hmm. Uh, so on that speculative note, I think it's uh, a good place to end. Uh, Taylor, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, my guest today has been Taylor Hudak. Uh, she is a journalist and editor with Activism Munich. Uh, you can find her on Twitter at underscore Taylor Hudak, correct? That's correct. Okay. And uh, I definitely recommend following her and uh, also checking out Activism Munich and uh, keeping up with what's going on with the Assange trial. Um, Activism Munich also offers a lot of a lot of coverage of other uh, happenings in this world. So do check them out. They're independent, uh, no sponsors or advertisers. Um, very slick site too. <laughs> um, so Taylor, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Me too. Thank you. Take care.